This Week in Startups is brought to you by AdRoll, the most widely used retargeting platform in the world with over 25,000 advertisers. Get started with a $100 credit at adroll.com slash twist. And Eero, the world's first home mesh Wi-Fi system. For free overnight shipping, visit eero.com slash twist. At checkout, select overnight shipping, then enter promo code twist. Our iTunes review of the week is from Christian JD18. I literally earned a spot at a great firm using a lot of the knowledge I learned from Jason and his guests. Leave your review on iTunes and be featured on the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. And today on the program, we're going to talk about the most important industry on the planet, which is food. We're going to have 11 billion people on the planet at the end of this century. Think about that. And we're going to have to sustainably and um, efficiently feed them. And food uh, is becoming a big business. And you have big agriculture taking over the Monsantos of the world. And their interests are in profits. But our guest today, Amol Dishpanda. Dishpanda? Dishpande. Dishpande. Yeah. Amol Dishpande has raised $50 million for the Farmers Business Network. And his goal is to use data to help farmers maintain their farms, not sell out to those big agricultural companies, mm -hmm. and just more efficiently uh, feed the world. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Is that accurate? Is that why you're doing this? Or are you doing this just to make a ton of money? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, um, well, this is an impact-oriented business. We're, we're doing this to help family farms all over the world, starting in the United States. Um, everybody in my company, all the way from you know, MIT-trained data scientists down to people who work in the field uh, in these local communities, uh, joins the company for one reason, which is to, to help farmers thrive and, and maintain uh, the family businesses they've had for many generations. What percentage of the food do, that we eat here in the United States comes from a local small family farm versus like a mega farm. Because my perception is that there are these huge farms that are feeding the bulk of people, and then there's these little farms that feed the rich people with the, a bunch of organic food. But I don't know if I'm right. That's just my perception of the world. How does our food supply actually work? Yeah, it's it's a little different than that. So, so for example, there's... Um there is a little bit of a divide in understanding. You know, typically, if you're on the coast, you're in New York, you're in San Francisco, uh, you, you think of a family farm as a small enterprise that's delivering you produce or something like that. Mm -hmm. But in fact, most of the calorific value, if you will, and yeah. the protein value for the world is delivered by larger farms than that, but still family enterprises. Got it. Okay, so they might farm thousands of acres, and they might be form farming crops that are used as feed, or they're used as um, uh, products for um, fuel production in some cases, or they're directly put in as food, in food ingredients. But they are uh, the critical part of feeding the world, mm -hmm. right? I mean, what happens for, for wealthy, wealthy people on the coast is important too. Uh, but if you're talking about feeding even the, the 300 plus million people in the U.S., these, these uh, broad acre farms in the, in the Midwest and, and other parts of the country are incredibly important and they're family businesses. Or is there like a big conglomerate that owns all these farms? When we think of the Monsantos of the world, they sell seeds, they sell pesticides, they sell this genetically engineered product to farmers. But do they own farms themselves? Is there a big farm conglomerate that we can all look at and go, my God, we hate them? Or, <laughs> you know, like these guys are doing it wrong? Or is it a bunch of individual farmers who have large farms that are being oppressed as we feel, you know, when we see Food Inc. or when we yeah. read about, you know, stuff in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times. Are they really being oppressed by the Monsantos and these people of the world to use products that are not in our best interests? No, I, I don't think it's it's quite that black and white. I, I, I think what, um, for, so first of all, to answer your first question, there isn't a large conglomerate enterprise that owns uh, a huge, huge amount of farmland. Why not? There are There are funds. Well, because a, a lot of the farmland that exists in the U.S. is owned by farmers, and it's been passed along through generations. Got it. And, and it's a wealth creation vehicle. It's an estate, estate management vehicle, and it's a way of life. Got so it. why would you sell it, even if it's worth... Uh, a lot of money, and maybe there's an investor or somebody who wants to buy it. Uh, it's not the culture or the nature of the person uh, who's farming to sell out. It's part of their, part of their it's in Got the bloodstream. It. So when we hear about those American farmers, salt of the earth, they want to keep their farms in their family, it's actually true. I, I believe it's very true. Got it. Yeah. Um, and are they, to my second question, we have this perception that they live season to season, mm -hmm. that they are... Um, 
making a small margin that they're under the heel and the thumb of you know Monsanto and put it under this massive pressure to make food that's bad for us, you know, and and make a ton of corn syrup and and make us all fat. What parts of my perception are correct and which parts are wrong? Well, I'll talk about the part that's co- the part that's correct. Okay, um, the part that's correct is that uh, farmers are either monopolized or, or facing an oligopoly on almost every side of their farm. So when you talk about buying inputs like seed or fertilizers or chemicals, it's a monopoly or oligopoly. When you're talking about buying farm equipment, they're dealing with one of a handful of companies. Got it. When you talk about marketing the end product, uh, they're dealing with a couple of businesses. Really, there's four or five that manage most of that. So Who are the people who manage the output? Who, who buys all this uh, stuff? Cargill. Uh, Cargill, uh, Archer Daniels Midland Corporation. Uh, in other countries, it's, it's companies like Bungay or, or Louis Dreyfus, depending on the region you're in. So they buy the corn, they buy the wheat, they process it, and then do they sell it to the brands or are, do they actually own the brands? Those are conglomerates that own brands? They, they rarely own brands. Uh, usually what, what you find, I worked at Cargill, so I know this uh, many years ago, is that uh, it's largely, a, a, in my opinion, it's a trading firm. Mm-hmm. So it's a merchant firm, right? So what they're doing is merchandising the farmer's crop. So they may interface with the brand owner. Uh, they may produce uh, derivative food ingredients or other things that, that go further downstream. Uh, but in, it's not typical for mm-hmm. those companies to have their own brands. Why, are, why did those, I mean, I can understand historically why the Cargill is the company that, that would exist, this middleman to do the arbitrage, maybe financial manipulation, you know, mm-hmm. um, blend out crops over many years, advance people money. I assume they do that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Um, wh- why aren't farmers selling directly to, I don't know, one of the food brands? And, you know, we hear about farm to table in the restaurant business. Mm-hmm. That seems like a very positive trend. Is, there's no, there's no middleman there or is there? And why wouldn't they sell directly? Usually it's, it's an issue of, of capital and, uh-huh. and then logistics and infrastructure. So, so for example, if, if you're farming two or 3,000 acres of, of corn mm-hmm. okay, or soybeans, um, you have a good product, it's a marketable product, there's a liquid market for it, but it has to get from your farm to a buyer who mm. can use it and pay a market price. So what is your solution? What, how, do you, how do you address this problem? Well, so... And at the company, just so people know, is the FBN, Farmers... Business Network. Do you refer to it as FBN or do you call it Farmers Business Network? I mean, most people call it FBN. Okay, and it's FBN Farmers on uh, the Twitter. And what's yeah. your domain name? Uh, FarmersBusinessNetwork.com. Okay, so people can go there and check it out. Yeah. So what is the product or service that you provide to the well, market? Well, so uh, th- there's been a trend towards uh, since machinery and farming has gotten more sophisticated, since you've seen the introduction of, of things like satellites and drones to be able to collect other uh, useful information, spatial information about the farm. Uh, to try to provide services back to the farmer to give them uh, better decision-making tools, so to speak, about agronomic or, or marketing decisions they may make. Uh, we come at this a little differently than most companies. Uh, what we do is we actually ask the farmer to contribute this information into a network. Ah. We charge a very, very low cost. It's $500 a farm, which is a de minimis cost. Right. Uh, most companies uh, that do uh, similar or software-type services charge 10, 20 times that. And then what we share back is analytics that helps a farmer make a better decision on things like seed selection, hybrid seed selection, uh, how much fertilizer to apply, um, how, how and where to purchase uh, their inputs and, and pay the right price, and then eventually uh, potentially how to market their grain. Um, this is the largest now scientific uh, database in the world of uh, agricultural information, and, and we do it all through a contributory network. So people previously would not want to give this information up, would they? Like, this would be considered proprietary. Like, I know what seeds to use. I know which seeds work. I know when to plant them. I, I don't know what the actual variables are. I'm assuming yeah. the seed selection you said. Yeah. Um, how much the seeds yield. Yeah. What are the other critical They're pieces of data? Scientific. You have to know how many seeds to plant per acre. It's called population. It. You have to know how much fertility to apply. Got it. Uh, oh, you have that to makes know sense. What, yeah. If you're buying a genetically modified seed, you have to know what traits you're going to purchase. Um, you have to oh, know when there's to many traits it. that you can there purchase. There are. You have to know when to plant it. Got it. Um, you have to know what the impact is. I mean, there's, it is a sophisticated <laughs> uh, set of variables that, mm. that nobody, no matter how, how bright they are, could possibly compute. Um, which is why uh, infrastructures like what we've built and the access to, to the kind of acreage and the amount of data we have gives a farmer a unique advantage. All right, let's hear from a farmer here. We have a little bit of video we're going to cut to, and I see a nice farmer here. Our first reaction was to invite farmers in the area to join in with it. I love being around other successful farmers. I learn from them. 
We have thousands and thousands of fields in the FBN network. It grows every day. One farmer can now have access to more information than has ever been possible. That cumulative power of all the other farmers providing their data, just like what we did, allows the science then to give us information and say, hey, if you're going to place the hybrid on this field, here's your best chance to reach your maximum potential. FBN is a community. It's about farmers cooperating with each other to get the most out of their information. Really farmers helping farmers. And like an aha moment, it, it's really good stuff. The future holds amazing things for farms and their information. We can't wait to show you what's possible. So we look forward to seeing you in FBN. This is going to help out a lot of people. What we've done is we've created an opportunity for farmers to contribute far more information um, anonymously mm. and get back, get back value out of it at a tremendously low cost. And I, I think this is, a, this is a key point. I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of times people bring these solutions to farmers assuming, well, okay, they don't know much about software, so I'm going to charge them a lot of money for this. Got it. And um, that, that is exactly what, what we want to stay away from. We want to make this information accessible want to reduce the financial barrier to consuming it. And then ultimately it's on, on us to create a product that um, can make it easy to consume. All right, when we get back from commercial break, I want to see the actual product yeah. and how it works yeah. uh, when we get back on This Week in Startups. Everybody, I want to take a moment to tell you about retargeting. This is a very, very important thing for startups to understand because customer acquisition is what it's all about and ad role is the best retargeting platform on the planet. Over 25,000 advertisers use it. And I want to tell you today about a new product they have. It's called Send Roll. No, it's not sending to get your rolls and buttered rolls. No. This is about email. And Send Roll uh, lets you get all those people who are window shoppers, people who are checking out your website, and then you can convert them into buyers, which is what you want, getting them to sign up for your product or service by email. So imagine they visit your site, but then they get an email follow-up. Senroll is powerful retargeting tech plus effective emails, and the results have been spectacular. The average Senroll gets a 45 to 60% open rate and a 10 to 20% click-through. And I can tell you, running inside.com, that that is probably three times, four times the industry average. And it's so easy to set up a send roll campaign. It just takes minutes. They give you all the templates, and they have a 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week customer service line if you need help. And what I always like to do when we have somebody who has a product uh, that's loved on our program, we don't want to read any sponsor messages, any partner messages for things that are not loved. The great part is a lot of my founders from my portfolio use AdRoll, so it's very easy for me to talk about their new product, SendRoll. James Heller, the founder of Rapify, which went through my incubator, says AdRoll is an integral part of our customer acquisition strategy. It allows us to continue to garner impressions long after the initial customer interaction. It's also one of the most cost-effective tools to bolster any integrated marketing strategy. AdRoll is the best retargeting platform, period. That's according to James Heller, good friend of mine and one of my investments at Rapify. So here's your call to action, everybody. Try SendRoll and get a $100 credit. Just go to adroll.com slash twist, adroll.com slash twist, adroll.com slash twist, and get that $100 credit. And please try that send roll and give them some feedback uh, and let them know that at Jason sent you. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. We're talking about agriculture and the Farmers Business Network. You can go check out farmersbusinessnetwork.com. My guest is Mo Dishpanda. Amol Dishpande. Amol Dishpande. Yeah. Day. Ah, right. Mm. Uh, and Amol has raised, you raised about 50 million bucks for this business, huh? Yeah. Is it capital months. intensive? No. No. Just a lot of people want to invest in it, you know? That's, that's the most candid answer we've ever had uh, from people when they raise the money. <laughs> no, it's not capital intensive. You just have to go and acquire farmers by explaining to them why they should give over their most proprietary data. Give to get. Yes. What's that conversation like? What was the first 10 conversations like? How do you convince the first 10? Because once you have a, you have 2,500 farms. Uh, approaching 2,700 now. Yeah. 2,700 farms. So when yeah. you have 2,700, it's going to get a lot easier. I yeah. give my data, I get back 2,700 pieces of data, mm -hmm. theoretically. Yep. So I'm just a small percentage. Yeah. 
But getting the first 10 people on board must have been very difficult. Did you do that yourself? What were those conversations like? Um, well, yeah. In, in fact, the idea came from farmers themselves. I, I think there's a, there's a notion or assumptions that are made that um, farmers are these reclusive individuals that won't share information, um, that they're paranoid, that they live on their farms. And, well, I mean, people uh, can also think farmers are kind of like, you know, not very tech yeah. and they're in middle America, which is not true. These no. guys are super sophisticated. No, yeah. And, it, and I and think it's, it's an underestimation and of, of, of the farming community. And what we did was we went and talked to a bunch of farmers. And so it was very obvious to me after talking to them that if, if they were convinced that there was going to be value back, that they would share the information and if they trusted the system. Hmm. So this is where, you know, the impact orientation of the business, the types of people that are in the business is really important because you have to trust that the company is not going to turn around and sell itself to a big ag business. or not going to turn around and do uh -huh. something with the, the information that's uh, not beneficial to the farmer. Right. So there has to be some agreement on the terms of this data. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like if I'm going to give my health data, number one, you can't reveal my identity. It's got to be safe, right? Exactly. Like if I'm going to give you all my data, how many steps, my weight, whatever, my heart rate, you got to anonymize it. So there's got to be Correct. some data security here. Exactly. And then, very interestingly, do you have to make a promise you're not going to give it to Monsanto or some other players? Yeah, we, we, we make it very clear that no personal identifiable information is ever shared. Uh -huh. uh, on the network, that's part of our terms of service. We also make it very clear that, you know, upon a change of control, that nothing changes about our terms of service. And this is an interesting uh. dynamic because we, you know, we want to be, um, we want to be clear that what we want to be is an independent business that serves farmers. Right. Um, we don't want to be a subsidiary of a, of a big agricultural business or anything like that. We want right. to build a unique independent brand that serves farmers. <laughs> it's really interesting on a legal concept, the terms of service surviving. Yeah. A, um, a bankruptcy or a change of control in some way, any of those things. Yeah. It turns out in a change of control, what happens if you were to sell to Monsanto or something like that? You get fired by your board, Monsanto buys it. What happens to the, to the company? Well, I mean, um, they would have to continue forward, um, you know, operating the business uh, in the way that we had set forth ah. or renegotiate those terms with the farmer, at which time they could choose to exit. Got it. So the data right. would be... Yeah, they would choose to exit the system. And that, you know, that to me is um, a, a key point here, which is that we have to be independent. We have to be trustworthy for right. our farmers. This is something that we put you know, a lot of thought into. And that goes to the people, too, that we hire. We have to hire the right kind of people. Uh, okay, show me the product. Okay. So here, I'm showing you a, a part of this. So at, what is aggregated <laughs> data, right? So here is a that, um, command plus on, or just as, can you zoom in? Can you well, make it a little bit bigger? I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll this is a, so this is a, a hybrid seed, ah. a specific hybrid seed. Pioneer. Okay? Pioneer, which is owned by DuPont. DuPont owns P1151 Pioneer. Yeah. And the way it's 111 days to maturity. Exactly. And it's Got a corn, it. it's a corn hybrid. Got it. And you take a look at the amount of acres we have in FBN. It's 154,000 plus acres. Now, so you have 154,000 acres across how many farms? Well, so it's probably, we don't publish the number of farms that contribute. It's probably 100 farmers that contribute okay. to this data set. And they've all guess. used the same seed. They've all used this hybrid. Got it. Okay, but they've used it under different conditions. They've used it in different years. They've used it on different soils. They've used it with different previous crops. Yeah, different locations. And what we've done is taken that and now said, so a typical farmer, let me put this in perspective for you. Mm. A typical farmer will spend $300,000, our farmer in our network, on seed. Huge decision every year. $300,000 in seeds. Our farmer, our average farmer right now, because we, we have uh, given our size so of our farm. That's their big bet, I guess. It's one of the very big bets they make. And you're typically making the decision based on a data set that's up from a plot trial that's probably uh, a quarter of an acre large. Got it. So now it's here- It's not real world, in other words. It's not real world, and it's not sizable. Mm. So here we have 154,000 plus acres of data. Now, Amazing. to put you here- how scientific this is, we can show you nitrogen response by those acres because the spatial data set, we, uh, we have the data on how much nitrogen was supplied on that field with that hybrid seed. We can connect those, those points and make this So the graph. nitrogen, um, which will help things grow, yeah. but it's expensive, right? Exactly. To put nitrogen down, yeah. it's, it's some sort of a, a fertilizer. Exactly. It's a, it's a nutrient. And so that, it's got a, that nutrient has to cost money. Exactly. So using the right amount will then impact yield. But if you use too little, it could affect yield. You use too much, I, I, is it theoretical it would have a negative impact or it would just be wasteful, I guess? It, it could have a negative impact, but at minimum it's wasteful. Right. And, and so what you want to know 
is, you know, what is the impact of nitrogen, for example, on this on this hybrid seed? Here's cool. another one. Okay. You know, population. Ah, this is so very this is the density of seeds per acre. And this is this is very interesting one for me. Um, wow, well, look at that. Thousands from an ag background, seeds per acre. For people who are listening and not watching, we have the seeding rate and um, yield. The yield, and it shows how many seeds per thousand acres. So that 200 or 214 is the yield. That's the yield. And you notice as the population goes up, you asked about diminishing returns. There actually is a leveling or diminishing return, meaning Probably you don't that. get an incremental benefit from planting more seeds an acre. This is So when you hit 31,000 seeds an acre, you've hit 214.4. And then if you go up to 34.9 or even greater than 34.9, you actually go down. It diminished so, to so, 213. Yeah, and so now think back to what, what I just mentioned, which is at $300,000 a year on seed. If yeah. you bought 20% more seed than you needed, that's 60,000 bucks. Yeah. We you, charge 500 bucks for our system. Wow. To contribute your data. So you can understand what the ROI is. This is just one discrete example. And this is all why. reported because the farmer just wrote on a clipboard or into an no. iPad. This is what this they is did? actually. This is actually directly from the machine. Oh, the machines. Yes. That drop the seeds. Yeah, exactly. Record the planter. exactly the planter. Yes. Records how many seeds were dropped per acre. Uh, well, so there's a monitor system. Ah. Okay. And the farmer actually puts in the hybrid they used. There's a, a rate so at which they want to plant. It's a computer. Yeah. It's a and computer in the seeder. Files, and we read those files. In some cases, ah, that data so they is export a CSV and you upload it and read it? it. It can be uploaded through our website. Ah. Actually, we have an API integration with John Deere where they can wirelessly send it to us. That's fascinating. We have That's how sophisticated. There's a computer on the tractor Absolutely. or the, uh, the seed distributor. Yes. Yep. Is that what it's called? Planter. Planter. The seed yeah. planter yeah. has a computer in it. Does it have GPS as well? Absolutely. Yeah, they've had GPS wow. for a long time. So they have GPS. Yeah. That GPS is within five or ten feet. And it's very it's it's very accurate. I've yeah. found that, you know, and we compare, we get a planting file. Mm -hmm. We compare it with a, a harvest file when the yield comes in, and then we're able to overlay those things. In the middle of the year, they may apply nitrogen. We'll get that data set as wow. well. And we can put it into this spatial analysis. So there's not going to be reporting errors because, or the, the reporting errors are are not going to be subject to humans making mistakes and reporting on a clipboard. Right. It, it could, there could be a calibration error or something sure. else in the equipment, but we can, uh, we can actually both identify those. And then another thing we do is we try to behaviorally improve, you know, the, the way a farmer collects sure. their data each year so that we get a better data. I'm betting data it would be outliers too. So you could just look and say, hey, you know what? Whatever the lowest and the top numbers are in the seed planters, let's just look at them. Are they what standard deviation off are they? Yep. And then we can just inform them that hey, maybe you could even inform the the farmer. Hey, by the way, your seed planter might be off. Yeah, well, the, sometimes, so sometimes, far sometimes the mean. Sometimes there's you know it's funny you mentioned that because we're I'm showing you seed. Yeah. Later this year, we want to release like equipment analytics, for example, where we're able to actually measure the equipment and. How is the equipment doing? You know, look at the, take a look at this, for example. I can oh, so show you. you would know that I have the 1997 version of this seed planter. You have the 2014. Yeah. And maybe uh, mine's not accurate. Yeah. I can also ask, did you lease it or buy it? Because there may be differentials in service that you wow. get depending on what you did. Take so a look at this. You'll be able to give advice on that. Yeah. Look at this. And that's the equipment. Yeah. These, these planters, they can cost $400,000. Wow. And some farmers so own multiple you might be able to correlate which planter gets the most yield and not know why. Y you could you could correlate, but you could also boil it down to which planter is, you know, does it work at high speeds? Here's an example. Uh, so I'm showing return uh, uh, yield by planter speed. Mm -hmm. And you notice there's a diminishing return as these planters go faster. Now, what you'll find is um, there's a value to being able to plant a crop faster. So a lot of companies are uh, promoting high-speed planters. And of course, they're they're more expensive. And the question is, is there a return on that investment? Right, and right? it looks like there is a two percent return for two to four percent return until you hit five point four miles an hour, and then it dramatically goes down. Yeah, and so what we're able to do now is we can break out in our next iteration of this high speed planters and mm -hmm. say what is the actual incremental return and how wow. fast can you go? Can people you go must seven be miles? Terrorized of you, the people who make the equipment, like because they're the, they're a lot of times people market equipment, and it's not actually better. What? It's just marketing. Well, it's funny you mentioned that, you know, you take the instance of seed, right? right. Um, there's you know, one thing about farmers I've, I've learned over many years working with farmers, um, even through, you know, um, probably 12, 13 years now, um, is that they're very loyal. Right. And so they choose a brand and they like the brand and they stick with it. Sure. And sometimes... Human nature. Um, yeah, exactly. It's human nature. And sometimes the person is in their community. And, and the reality is you're running a business. And so when the data suggests 
that there's a better hybrid seed for you to plant. Sure. You, you need that objective information to, at minimum, get yourself to, to cost neutral if you're taking a lesser hybrid. Right. Because, but, but how much can you invest in a relationship, right? A lot, but you also have to make an economic decision at the end of the day. So how far are we from having, and I'm just going to fast forward here, but you, you're studying you know, the data to yeah. figure out how to be more efficient. We have equipment that's iterating to become more efficient. Yeah. When is the loop going to close where your data will be fed into the machine and the machine will just make the decision and all farms will be 100% automated? Is that going to happen in our lifetime? Like the self, the way we talk about level four autonomy in cars, is that going to happen in farming where these farms will just run themselves and the data will just iterate, 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 and we'll just trust machine learning to do it? Yes. I mean, uh, that's the future. I, I can't tell you, you know, with 100% certainty when that happens, but, but it's pretty obvious, right? You take, you take the situation with autonomous vehicles, for example, yeah. on the roads. Uh, in a way, that's far more complex than, than doing it for uh, farming. You know, you don't have the issue of, of other cars to hit uh, all yeah. over the place. You don't so, have 100 million drivers and yeah. their erratic behavior and mental state to deal with. Right. Uh, th there are safety issues. These are massive pieces of equipment, and there's a lot of things to be considered. I don't think you can yeah. trivialize it, but I think that's probably where you're headed. And when you look at uh, some of the data-driven farmers we have in our network, um, this is kind of a first step. To, th they're looking at this information and saying... How can I use that to make a better decision, operate my machinery better, operate my farm better? Mm. And eventually, um, they may be able to operate many pieces of equipment at once without the need for, for as much labor. Let's take a quick break here. But when we get back, I want to know how much more efficient have farms gotten in the last decade when we yep. get back on This Week in Startups. And I am so excited uh, to have Era Eero. I was pressing Eero the other day, but it's Eero, like an ear. Eero, um, which is the world's first home mesh Wi-Fi system. If you don't have it, it is unbelievable. Mesh basically means the routers, and you buy them in like three packs, uh, work together to blanket your apartment or house with Wi-Fi. I use it, and I have to tell you, Mesh is just a game changer. With a simple iOS or Android app, um, Eero just blankets your home. It's perfect. It works. I love the product. It's one of those game-changing products that once you use it, you're like, oh, my God, I'm not having this. Uh, debate with the members of my family as to like, why isn't the Wi-Fi working here? Why is the Wi-Fi, why is Netflix slow? Why is this? Thing? Everything just starts to work amazingly. It's so reliable. And they've got a special offer for This Week in Startups listeners. You just go to eero.com and uh, at checkout, you select overnight shipping and enter the promo code TWIST and it will be free. Not the Euro units, the shipping. Overnight shipping for free for This Week in Startups listeners. I guarantee you're going to love this product. EERO.com. EERO.com. Eero is the, it's probably the best thing for you to buy this Christmas for somebody uh, or for your home. It, literally all this nonsense with your family's Wi-Fi not working and all these different places in your house and people fighting over who's on Netflix, turn this off, reboot the router. It just goes away. Everything just works. It's the router that should have been built and it's the Wi-Fi system that should have been built a decade ago. But finally, here we are, year 15 of Wi-Fi. Euro has fixed it, and it works. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guest is Amol Deshpande, and he is the CEO and co-founder of the Farmers Business Network, which you can find at farmersbusinessnetwork.com, and you can follow their fascinating Twitter handle, at FBN Farmers. Um, when we left our hero, who you spent six years at Kleiner. Six years. Made a bunch of investments. How many investments did you do when you were there? I was involved with a lot. Got you it. know how it is. I mean, it changed a lot over the years that I was there, but I was involved with probably 25 or 30 in one capacity or another. Yeah. And you got to work with John Doerr? Oh, for, yeah, of course. Work with him for six years. Brilliant guy, right? Absolutely brilliant guy. And a yeah. big, big thinking guy and a very generous guy, too. And you were there during that whole uh, kerfuffle. I was there for everything. Um, yeah. You know, when I started, uh, it was in uh, two... I was uh, hired in 2007, started in early 2008. Oh, um, wow. Seems like ages ago. But I, I went there to be an entrepreneur, and it was an amazing experience. And, um, you know, they were very supportive of that um, career path, so to speak. It, it was kind of a, it's a fascinating place if you're an entrepreneur. What do you think of the whole Ellen Pow trial and all that nonsense that went on and just craziness? <laughs> you know, I can't I How can't do you comment? contextualize? I'm not the specifics, I, but how do you contextualize I, it looking back on it? Do you think, like, the firm was broken in some way or... I, you know, I can't, I can't get into it. I yeah. can't comment on it. But all, all I can say about it is that um, I wish it never happened. Um, yeah. It's unfortunate. It's a, it's a good learning experience for everybody that's involved. Yeah. You know? 
Interesting. It was, I always found it interesting because you had some of the best female venture capitalists at the time there. They had a larger, you had a larger number of females than any other firm. Yeah, it, it, there's brilliant, there's brilliant people there. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I keep in touch with, with a lot of my, my friends and partners uh, from KP and I seek them out for advice as I'm running my business. As I said, one of, one of the partners there led the investment, Randy Komisar in our company yeah. and has been tremendously supportive. Uh, mm. I, I don't think I'd be where I am if I hadn't spent six years there and gotten to know all the people there. It's a really interesting thing for our industry because there, clearly there were some bad things that occurred, but Alan Powell lost the trial. It's very hard. It's like no winners, right? Yeah. No heroes in this narrative, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, what I, what I would say about, about Kleiner is that they, it, it's, a, it's a place for entrepreneurship. I mean, you yeah. know, you take somebody like John, and the thing that was fascinating for me being there is that it's, uh, it's kind of like um, kid in a candy store if you're an entrepreneur. You yeah, know, you, you get access to so many things um, and you really get the opportunity to think big. And that that I think is really important. Yeah, um, it's tough when one it seems like there was a bad apple there who screwed it for everybody. Um, I'll leave it at that. It's not the episode about Ellen Powell. We talked about it on the show a whole bunch. Um, so um, my question before we went to the commercial break yeah. uh, was how much more efficient because you've been in ag for over 10 years. Yeah. Going on 20. <laughs> We're going on 15. 15. Yeah. How much in the last 15 years, 10 to 15 years that you've been in it, how, how much more efficient has it gotten every year or cumulatively? Has it doubled in efficiency or the yields 5%, 1% better a year? How much more efficient has it gotten in those last decade, let's say? So, so uh, the, the yield gains have tapered off. Um, you know, there was a, a massive, massive improvement uh, as a result of the introduction of uh, genetically modified crops, which, which did result in improved yield. Um, How much did gen genetically modified crops improve yield? It, it was quite a bit. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't have the exact number. Would it be fair to say it, it doubled it or 50%? I think over time it did. It, it was, it was it. significant. Right. It was very significant. Emmy Weber producer, Jackie, will see if you can find a statistic while we talk. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's very significant. It could be double. Yeah. Or more. And, and, you know, now it's kind of one of the reasons that, that data and these other technologies have made their way into ag are becoming important because you have to find other ways now yeah. to make gains. Um, it's so the genetic the, gains have tapered, you think? Th they are. I mean, there, there's, uh, if you look at the actual yield uh, results, um, there's uh, less improvement. And, you know, you look at what are the other options that you have if you're a farmer to actually improve your yield? Mm. And information and access to information is definitely one of them. It's also an opportunity to improve your profitability. But if you're talking about your yield, yeah. um, you know, you, you've seen how you know, complicated this multi-set variables um, equation is. Uh, and you, gotta, you can't possibly, as one person, keep track of all of that. What do you think your, so how many years has your software been in the field now, the data sharing network? Uh, we literally launched this only about 18 months ago. Okay. Is... What is your anticipation of what the gains will be for the industry overall? Could you do low single digits per year compounded and double efficiency in 10, 20 years? Do you think the data is capable of that? I mean, obviously you pursued this. Obviously people threw a lot of money yeah. towards you in this project. What do you think the, the efficiency will be? Could you reach the efficiency of genetically modified crops with just data? I, I think you can uh, you can make significant gains towards the overall genetic potential of whatever the crop is or, mm. or the genetics is that you that you plant it. Um, you know what is the rate of increase uh, yeah. over time? Um, we need a number of years uh, right. to know for sure, but I think you can you can move towards the genetic potential uh, of the Got crop, it. which is which there's still a lot of potential. The other place I think there's a lot of room for improvement, and where we're focused is on profitability of the farm hmm. uh, to make the the return on assets or the return on equity for the farmer on par with the the various constituents that they do business with around them. Ah, so what is a farmer's typical margin if they if they sell ten million dollars in wheat or corn, what do they, what do they net at the end of the day? Well, sadly this year it's, it's uh, de minimis or negative. What? Or in some cases highly negative. Well, there's a commodity downturn right now. I mean, corn, oh. for example, is $3 or a little bit above $3. And given the cost of seed and fertilizer and renting land, if you're renting it, um, they could be negative. They could lose absolutely. money working every day. Absolutely. A lot of our farmers this year will lose money. And this is... What do they make on average, though? On, a, on, a, on an average year, do they make 5%, 10%? In, in a good year, that's a, that's a pretty generous margin. And, 5%. Re and remember, it's, it's highly volatile. Mm. So, so this is another thing. You know, you look at... You think about... Talk about entrepreneurs, right? Um, this is one of the things I, I admire about farmers. Uh, give, any given year, 
uh, there's so much volatility that you have to deal with. Um, it's unbelievable. So uh, it can vary. But for example, this year, a lot of our farmers will be in the red. Wow. Um, so making them more profitable, forget about just making every acre more efficient, because yeah. that might be the wrong metric. Yeah. Making them profitable, which really has two two or three major pieces. One, how much they're spending yeah. coming in. So if they can reduce spending. Yeah. And they can be, then second, if they can be more efficient in the actual growth of the crops, yeah. the, the process of making them, so yeah. the manufacturing, and then selling, if they can be a little bit more efficient on all three of those things, they could drive profitability. And that really is the goal. If they're profitable, they have more power, they have more sustainability. Yes. So it's not just how much could, more efficient could each acre be. That's the wrong metric to look at, you think? Or it's just a one of many? It's one of many. Mm -hmm. uh, profitability uh, needs to matter at the farm level. It's to be, if it's to be sustainable, if, if it's to be attractive to pass along in generations, mm -hmm. right, uh, then it has to be an enterprise that, that somebody wants to manage. Like you'll talk to a lot of farmers and they'll tell you these stories about their kids who uh, went off to college and decided to take a, a different kind of job. They went into the... Um, investment industry they went into the tech industry they did yeah. whatever but they it didn't come back and farm it wasn't that, attractive i'm going to bust my ass part of my french to make yeah. 5 or 10% That's or right. zero right and what does monsanto make they must make a 30 40 50% margin i bet the, the return on equity and return on ex assets for players like seed companies and yeah. others is far far in excess of what the farmers is so there there it's unfair in that way or maybe it is i mean maybe if they're making something that impacts more people well i I, I don't think I don't think people are looking for parity necessarily, but Just, but you have to ask yourself, you know, if the the patron of all these enterprises, I'm buying equipment, I'm buying seed, I'm buying fertilizer, I'm renting land, I'm marketing my my crop, and every single one of those parties is an oligopoly, right? Then, and my return is is low single digits or negative in many years, and right. everybody else's return is low double digits to to mid teens. Is, is that, it may not be you're seeking parity because it's fragmented, right? It's gotta be a, the, it has to be a little bit more fair. Yes. And it's very interesting what's happening in the world. You have entrepreneurs like yourself who are using data and transparency. And this in this case, it's opt-in transparency by the weakest uh, amongst the constituents, right? They have the least power yeah. in one way. Yeah. But they do have a lot of power in another way, which is once they get the data, that data is going to allow them to negotiate. And they're going to say, hey, you sold me um, you know, these seeds. Yeah. And it didn't do well. And they say, oh, well, it was, it was your fault. Yeah. And in the past, they'd be like, okay, maybe it was my fault. Now they can say, no, no, no. Au contraire, mon frère. Look, 200 other farmers, you, you sold us busted seeds. Yeah. Everybody got bad seeds or everybody got seeds that didn't perform to the level you thought they would or we thought they would. Can they go back and renegotiate? Can they get a make good? Is that starting to happen? People taking this data to the seed sellers and saying, hey, look, this is they're holding up the paper and look at the data saying, hey, give us a better deal. That's a great question. That's exactly what's happening. Really? And because we publish price data too. Oh. So, so this is really interesting. Like uh, seed, you publish what price. they paid for it. Yeah, we, we aggregate. Was there the transparency in that or no? We aggregate. We have a, an app called Price Transparency. We aggregate and oh, anonymize yum, invoices yum. on seed and chemicals. And it's amazing. Like some of these commoditized, commoditized inputs, two farmers 30 miles away from each other in rural Minnesota We'll pay 30% different prices what? for commodity input. You know what this reminds me of is healthcare. Yeah. You go in to get your meniscus worked on in your knee and you pay 9,000. I get mine worked on at 6,000. It's like, yeah. what, what's the difference? They, they started publishing this data from healthcare as part of the Obama Act. And it was like, why is knee surgery varying by you know 3X, 4X, 5X? It makes no sense. Uh, it's and and when you're talking about a thin margin business, yeah, how can you afford to pay thirty percent more for commodity input? So all we did, and this is this is bizarre. This might strike you as bizarre, but amazingly, the reason this happens is because people obfuscate the price. Sure, there should be price transparency on those inputs, but it's not given to the farmer. We offer that, so that's exactly what's happening, Jason. They're taking this information and they're saying, okay, well, I, I know because of FBN's data that the right price for this input is ten dollars. Mm. Why are you charging me twelve dollars? In fact, FBN is saying they can deliver it to me for uh, ten bucks. So how how can you, as a local allegedly multi-billion dollar business not be as or more efficient than they are. You're charging the farmers 500. You've got a couple thousand of them. Uh, I'm not a genius at math, but I think, <laughs> you know, 2,000 yeah. times 500 is not a lot of money. Yeah. 
um, how are you going to make more money? Where do you, where, I mean, you can't be making a million or $2 million a year if people are putting 50 million in. What's your business? Yeah, so uh, this, is, this is where uh, I think our approach gets very unconventional, mm -hmm. but also very disruptive in the market. What we do is we, we say, okay, wh what good is the information if you can't really take action on it and, and do better for yourself, okay? Uh -huh. You can consume this information, there's certain actions you can take, but if you're being monopolized, or, or there's an oligopoly. If you go in and say, I'm paying 30% more, the guy can say, screw you, get the hell out of my office. You're paying what you're paying. What we do is we will go and get in the middle of those commerce streams to offer the farmer an alternative. So we say, okay, your input, um, your input should cost $10. Uh, we have an alternative supply chain we create and say, we can deliver that to your farm for 10 bucks. Wow. And, we're and that's able to, typically seeds or equipment or what? Uh, right now, it's mostly what's called crop protection products, so agricultural uh. chemicals, but eventually it'll be equipment, it'll be seed, it'll be everything. And what that does is give the farmer a negotiating tool to go in and say, okay, I not only have the information, I have an alternative. And uh, we are getting massive growth out of that. And you get a piece of that action. We so do. So if I put you do. into a better product, I at, get a better 20, price. at a better price, I get 20%, 50% of the uh, difference or yeah, something? Some of these are very large large dollar amounts. Um, we, we keep a percentage, um, yeah. but we pass along the vast majority of the savings to the Got farmer. It. And this is, again, a differentiated mindset. So right? you're just fighting for the farmer in every instance. Bingo. Yeah, it's and, interesting. And, you know what it reminds me of? I remember when I heard the uh, Aaron Patzer talk about Mint, yeah. you know, financial yeah. stuff. He, you, you authenticated all of your bank accounts with Mint to get a 360-degree view of your credit cards, of your bank accounts. And then it would say, by the way, did you know that you're getting charged this amount for your checking account, this amount per check, this amount per ATM? There are these three other offers that are better. Would you like one of them? Click here. Mm -hmm. And if they click it, they got a bounty from that company. It did cost the, actually the consumer zero. And then you have these people like Wealthfront, which I have an investment in, um, and some of these other robotic advisors, robo-advisors, they call them, which is kind of derogatory. But um, they can look at it and say, hey, you know, we, we've actually done all this. Fidelity charges 15 bips or 20 bips, and we're going to charge just 25. So we're going to compress all that money that Morgan Stanley or Goldman or Alliance Bernstein is charging you. you. This empowering the individual... Um, it's going to build, we talked about loyalty earlier, massive loyalty from these farmers, huh? Yeah, and, and you have to prove it over time. I, I love the analogy of Wealthfront. I, yeah. We talk about that within our company. I think it's a, a similar attitude and approach. And I'd like to tell you that this is tremendously hard to do, but it's rather, rather straightforward in this industry because yeah. <clears throat> innovation and, and somebody taking a contrarian approach really has not happened. I mean, you have to, I've been to thousands of farms probably in my yeah. life. You have to get in there deep and really understand um, to be able to break the mold. And that, you know, that's how we make money. And we make money by making the farm more profitable. It's not by charging you a license for the data or charging you fees for the software. Um, that is uh, just a business process on the front end that you have to opt into first. You have to be in that mindset for us to help you. Since you're so informed about the space, let me ask a question that I think yeah. a lot of people are struggling with, which is we hear about GMOs. Yeah. We hear about the EU and people banning GMO-based products and wanting organic. But I made a visit to Monsanto. Yeah. I spent a day there. Yeah. And I talked to some farmers. And obviously, it was a PR-driven, like, bring Silicon Valley there. Yeah. They br brought us all there on a private jet. It was like 12 <laughs> people. Yeah. You know, but it was very interesting, yeah. like, to go there and spend time with them. You have a family or? Yeah. Two kids. Five and three. Do Boys. You, if you had some GMO product there, would you feed it to them? Do you feed it to them? Do you think that GMO is necessarily a bad thing or are GMOs not good or bad? They need to be studied and they could be both. How do you view that with your own family and how do you view it as a technologist? Yeah, I, I'll give you both views. Uh, my wife, my uh, two young kids, we eat all kinds of products that were grown using GMO inputs. Okay. And, and I'm completely convinced that they're safe. Um, and I think that from a scientific or a technical standpoint that, you know, there's no really rational scientific argument that's ever been made that they're unsafe. Okay. The, the, the debate about, you know, a farming practice, so to speak, to me is, is independent from the making the farm more efficient. When you take some of these very large broad acre farms that form the basis for food ingredients that really feed the world, forget San Francisco, 
uh, San Francisco or New York City or Los Angeles for a minute. Think about you know the other 300 million people. Yeah, or Paris, London, yeah. and you know Barcelona, sophisticated cities yeah. where people buy into organic over GMO. Yeah, but but might these people be wrong? Like we had a huge anti-nuclear movement in the 70s. Yeah. Which net net resulted in the burning of more oil and causing massive carbon to be put into the atmosphere and cause global warming. Yeah. And all these hippy dippy people and Bob Dylan and Jackson Brown all did the No Nukes concert. And I had a No Nukes t shirt when I was eight years old. And I believed <laughs> from the rhetoric, nuclear is not bad. Now I'm, you know, I'm a 45 year old guy. I do the research. If I'm in charge of the world or when I'm in charge of the world, I'm you know, president <laughs> of the planet Earth, I'm going to launch 300 nuclear reactors. Because this is the safest and most efficient way to stop global warming. Yep. We should be doing... Ma it's a it was a huge error. Yeah. And it was based on some bad emotional moments like Three Mile Island or Chernobyl. And now, tragically, Fukushima. These three things have scared the hell out of people for nuclear. Those were isolated instances with very old technology. This new technology is completely safe. Is that the same thing happening with GMOs where this stuff is actually safe and good for us and is going to be great for the world, but... We got a bunch of hippy dippies who are going, oh, we, we have to get off GMO. We have to eat organic. Because my understanding of organic is you have to put tons of pesticide on it because well, well, it's not resistant to bugs. Well, it, it, so th there's, a, there's a whole world of sort of organic farming practice and everything Yeah, let's else. get into it. Geared towards a specific kind of consumer. Right. right. But when you, when you talk about humanity, okay, feeding humanity, yeah. like for me, if, if I was starting an enterprise that was just feeding rich people, I, I just wouldn't be that into it. Yeah. I mean, what, what, I'm, what we're trying to do, the farmers that we work with, what they're trying to do is uh, feed humanity, mm -hmm. okay? It's, and humanity includes wealthy people in San Francisco and New York City, and they'll make their own decisions about their preferences and other things. But I, I feel like uh, when, you, when you talk about things like uh, global hunger, yeah. Or, or even hunger in the United States where people can't afford. I mean, you know what's going on in Silicon Valley where it's sure. impossible to find a, a decently priced one-bedroom apartment. Yeah. You know, having available low-cost sources of, of uh, ca nutrition, calorific value, is, is so essentially important for the population that I think it's really important not to be judgmental. So if you're asking me, is it misguided? I think the attacks on, on various farming practices and other things are misguided. Um, Consumers have options, and especially wealthy or yeah. upper middle class consumers, and they can exercise those. Yeah. But I, I don't think it's a fair criticism um, of people who are who are growing the world's food and all the rest of the people in the world who need need to need that nutrition. Um, uh, the the attacks are somewhat, um, I think, uh, over the top and and a little bit misguided. I, it feels so misguided to me because when I did my own research, I started reading about this. A lot of what these GMO things are doing is. They're saying, hey, let's make the husks a little more resistant to the bugs. Yeah. We make the husk a little more resistant. Yeah, sure, we might evolutionarily make the bugs a little more powerful. Okay, we get it. Um, but that might having these husks that are a little more resistant to bugs means you don't have to spray this massive pesticide on it. So you, you got to pick your poison here, literally. Do you want poison or do you want a GMO? And if there was a GMO that made things three times more fibrous and it wound up you know, correcting for obesity or half of obesity or 20% obesity, that might actually, it turns out obesity is the big killer anyway. Yeah, and, and the other piece of it is if you just sometime go do the exercise of go look at a field that's that's untreated, mm -hmm. that's un that hasn't had an application or that's being grown under a, a very strict organic practice and then compare that to a, a production ready um, agricultural field with with um, yeah. What's uh, the difference? It's huge. I don't. I, I, we've quantified before uh, um, the the actual difference in yield, but it, it's massive, and and you can see it visually. Double digit percentage. Yeah, oh yeah. You can sure. see it visually, and again, I'm I want to be you know clear about it. I'm not suggesting eating organic food is wrong. I, what I'm suggesting is that the 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 kind of the attacks against the the conventional food system I, I don't think are fair. Yeah. They are demonizing it yeah. without any long-term data, which the demonization of nuclear power was a critical error in the, in the course of humanity. It could have been an actual end of humanity error. We don't know in this crazy experiment of burning all the oil on the planet and all the coal on the planet versus having nuclear reactors, which one would end humanity quicker. I would argue that the number of people killed by nuclear reactors, which is... You know, in the low hundreds, I think, historically, it's going to be much less than the air pollution that has killed people, which is tens of thousands a year, I believe, in just India and China alone. Yeah. 
I mean, we're taking four or five years of people's lives in those countries. If they just went nuclear, I think they would be better off. And I think the same thing holds for GMOs. We might be able to treat the soil better, have longer lasting soil, more efficient farming, and have less malnutrition. I think you want less people starving and cheaper food. I, I, less people starving and cheaper food has to, has to be the first goal. I mean... Uh, it's just uh, unfortunate. One, one of the things that you know makes me proud to be part of the company, and I'm proud of uh, our employees because I think they have this this mission oriented mindset. As I tell them, you come to FBN, whatever your opinion as a consumer, you set aside. Your job here is to help farmers become more efficient, so that more of the world gets fed in an efficient way, and this family farming uh, infrastructure remains in place, right, the way that it is, uh, and can thrive profitably. Because uh, that's what matters, right? And yep. if you've ever talked to somebody who's starving or met somebody who's starving, then you feel it and you yeah. understand it. Yeah. And, you know, I think um, being an impact-oriented enterprise, you know, we have to uh, manage uh, manage these different points of view and other things. But for me, it's pretty clear. Like, we're helping feed the world. Food is getting so cheap. And it's gotten cheaper and cheaper it, this is a direct, uh, a direct uh, result of the efficiency of farming and uh, probably to a certain extent monetary policy, but yeah. it, food is getting cheaper. Is food trending towards zero f free in the same way that storage and bandwidth is trending to f has, has trended to free essentially for common uses? I mean, it's getting to the point where at some point the cost of vegetables, the, the cost of these raw ingredients is going to become completely de minimis in the, in the amount of value that exists in the world. Uh, no, they, well, all those things are temporary phenomenons. I mean, remember, they don't make, okay. they don't make more land. And so you, you need land, and, and no matter how efficient the production system is, uh, over time, you're, you're going to see more humans added to the planet. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to have to be more grown from the land we actually have. Okay. So the growth right. that we're faced with is going to mitigate against this, the, right. the crops going yeah. to zero or going to, like, free. Yeah, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be time points in time where the commodity market's depressed, and that happens. We're, we're in one of those points in time right now for, for a lot of our farmers. But uh, but that cycle will change. It will reverse itself. Um, people are economically rational, and when it does, then you know you'll see those um, those headlines where they say, "Oh, well, milk price is X or bread price is Y." Um, you don't see those right now, but um, mm -hmm. you know over time you'll see it. Is it true that the amount the the footprint of what's farmable is dramatically increasing due to GMO products? In other words, places where you couldn't grow corn. Because you have, you know, corn that requires or wheat that requires less water or can be, uh, you know, uh, grown in a, in a higher climate or a colder climate, that we're actually increasing the footprint and that's mitigating against this issue of, you know, encroachment on the farmland? Yeah, I would say uh, it's not just all that. Not all of that is just about GMOs. Some uh -huh. of it is about other things like reclamation of the land. Making what does sure that mean, reclamation of land? Well, being able to take a parcel of land and make sure it has access to water. If it's in a, ah. it's in a, a dry area, for as an example, okay? Is, you can't, if it doesn't have access to water, you're not going to be able to grow anything on the land, right? Um, so so if we solve for water, we could solve for land to farm in that's one of the one of the bare necessities Got i mean it. You, you you have to have it um, soil too absolutely yeah you have to have productive soil um but you can i mean I've, I've seen science around you know how you can take say marginal land and and make it more productive i think the genetics that you choose or use is one aspect of that mm -hmm. but there's actually a whole system system approach to that and that, that's an interesting concept because there are uh, places that probably people haven't thought to farm that might have potential. See, I, I, I get to talk to a lot of smart people. I'm not the smartest, you know, kid in the class by far. I'm not. But in talking to people about energy, mm -hmm. the cost of energy is going down so phenomenally. Mm -hmm. And then I was talking to people about water. Yeah. And the efficiency of desalinization has been getting better and better. Actually, people are now, because of Israel's need for water yeah. and also the California drought, everybody's thinking about desalinization again, and it's actually kind of works. Um, and it's just an energy issue. Yeah. And energy is an issue of cost. So as we have sustainable energy, there's this possibility that sustainable energy will be so cheap, wind, solar, even nuclear, um, fusion perhaps someday, that we could take salt water, desalinize it, 
ship it to regions where you could not have water and water would essentially become free. And then all of a sudden we're, we're farming corn in Arizona or, <laughs> or something insane like that. I mean, it's probably not going to be desert to soil, but is there enough soil to ship soil to other places? Is soil a, a, a limited quantity, like farmable soil, or is it everywhere? We just have to transport Absolutely. it. Absolutely. It's a limitable, limited quantity. I mean, that's, that's why you have variation in farmland prices, mm -hmm. right? I mean, some soil is far better than others for growing crops in general and certain crops specifically, right? There's other things you can do um, to improve your chances of getting a better yield, like the crop rotation you choose. And those yeah. are some of the analytics that we uh, we provide. But you take something like desal, for example. I mean, desalination, it, it's a it's an energy intensive process. And then the actual shipment or movement of water is energy intensive as well, okay? Because water is it's heavy and you got to move yeah. it. It needs and power so, to move. Right. And so, um, so... I don't know. I don't know that you can. That that's maybe too idealistic of a world. Um, yeah, might, I might be but, talking a hundred years out. But uh, but what I do think is, um, you know, as energy is is very implicated in in food production, mm -hmm. and in some cases is is a part of the food chain. Um, in all cases, a part of the food chain. And anywhere you can make an efficiency, then that's going to benefit. That's going to benefit the cost of food. It's going to benefit the farmer. It'll benefit the consumer. Are you going to go into livestock? Because it seems to me that with the shift especially in regions uh, you're indian yeah uh in india china just a large swath of asia we see the food the trend changing from you know rices and carbs and vegetables to inclusion of a lot more meat steak yeah. specifically um are you going to get into that area is there an opportunity to use data and do the same exact model but say hey Let's talk about chickens. Let's talk about eggs. Let's talk about yeah. livestock, and let's share data on that. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's an opportunity to do that. It's a it's a different system. Yeah, for um, sure. So you you different have inputs. to you have to think about it differently. So you know, as far as like product and skill sets and whatnot within the company, th those are not the specific skills we have in the business. But that is definitely an area that I've I've seen innovation. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen people innovating. So I think it has potential. You think there's going to be since you're an expert on all this stuff and you spent time as venture capital. You think that any of these beyond meats or or faux meats, 3D printed meats, that you know the the new fake chickens, which you know the fake chicken, um, you know I've eaten it and uh, a couple of times, and it fooled Mark Bittman in, of the New York Times in a in a recipe shoot off with, granted, uh, a lot of sauce, a lot of seasoning. It yeah. fooled him. Without seasoning, I think it's hard to fool people. But do you think those things, which are plant based, are going to um, become a major uh, staple of the human diet? Do you think that they're going to happen in our lifetime? Um, very, very, very challenging to say. Why? Um, well, because the amount of capital you probably need to put behind um, mm -hmm. those things to really innovate behind yeah. it. Um, but it's plausible. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that people will... Um, I, I think there's a there's a difference between sort of uh, thinking about where the consumer sentiment ultimately is going to go, and thinking about efficiency in in farming, so to speak. Yeah. Right. Um, consumer sentiment could go a number of different directions, and as we've talked about, there's pockets of opportunity um, for organic products or these products or those products, and then there's the world of humanity, mm -hmm. right? And humanity requires low cost. So usually, what you can assume is that the low cost system is probably going to win. Mm. An egg. Yeah, that might be another one of those coasts and major cities are eating the, yeah. the fake chicken when in fact we need China and India and, you know, places with a billion people yeah. to, to be embracing this and they're not going to get to it. Yeah. Net net, are you optimistic about the future of humanity? You know, given these complex problems that are not solvable um, with one actor, they, they require a coordinated effort. Are you optimistic, generally speaking, when you get deeply into this business and you start looking at it? Are you an optimistic person? I, uh, yeah. I mean, you, you have to be. I mean, yeah. to be an entrepreneur, my, my view is that um, with, with technology and, and, and you know, you, you think about like farming or agriculture, you know, an older industry and rural and everything else, uh, you're starting to see these things creep into into these markets and and there's only positive that can come from that yeah. as far as i'm concerned i mean it's positive for the for the farmer if we can help it um but it's going to ultimately going to be positive for the consumer for the people who live in the communities and everything else so I, i'm in tremendously optimistic I, I think people all all of these and, and the other thing i'm optimistic about is that um i've been thrilled with the kinds of people that we can attract to a business like this ah People right. want to come work there. Silicon Valley people? Yeah. I mean, uh, brainiacs, right? People yeah. who can go work anywhere and can do anything. 
um, they want to come work on helping farmers. Right. And they want to come work on helping feed the world. And that, to me, is um, uh, very inspiring. And I think if that keeps happening, then a lot of problems are going to get solved. And I think it's one of the nice things about this millennial generation. They get derided yeah. for a lot of things, and probably yeah. fairly um, in some cases. But the fact that they would find it very... Um, uh, uninspiring to make a ton of money making Google's, you know, ad network or Facebook's ad network six, you know, p- bips more efficient. Yeah. Or, you know, make the, the 27th Snapchat filter, you know, <laughs> to get engagement up by, you know, 1%. Yeah. The fact that they would find that to be death and just not inspiring and want to go do something that makes the world better, it gives me hope because the big problems we face are not the 17th filter on Instagram or the making more people deceptively click on Google ads because they keep moving the ad logo around. Yeah. We want to see people actually work on things that matter. So you have job openings, I take it, all this money in the bank. We, we have 100 people right now in FBN. We're growing to 200 over oh, the wow. next year. So you got to add two people a week, three yeah, people we'll, a week. Yeah, and, and, um, sure. you know, and to do that and then have them also be a mission fit with the business. Right. Is a man's challenge. I mean, the talent. You guys pay t- well, though. You, we, we, pay well. we pay well, and, and uh, we want to pay well. But we, uh, we have a high bar on talent, but more importantly, we have a high bar on the mission. Like, like somebody has to be mission oriented to join the business. Smart. And it makes so, it easier to manage them. You don't have to worry about like waking up and motivating them. Yeah, and you, you screen for that, right? Yeah. So, how, how do you are screen we gonna for that? What's the question you ask? Um, you know, it's usually not about a question you ask. It's about observations you make ah. um, in, in terms of their behaviors. It, it's a simple, you know, simple way to look at, um, you know, kind of the, the channels they come in through mm. um, is a good one. Like, for example, uh, we've done incredibly well with referrals here. Because it turns yeah. out, like, mission-oriented people, they all go hang out with mission-oriented people. Of course. So, you know, these, these really smart younger people who work for us, they, they're referring other people in the company. I, I've got... So many instances of that happening, and that's always a, a really good check. You um, like the missionary over the mercenary. I absolutely do. That's that's a. This is how I line. tell it. I look at the. I look when I when they're asking me about this paragraph in their employment agreement and overtime yeah. and the you know this and that and all these like things. It's not about like the mission, like you know how are we going to inspire entrepreneurs to take on bigger challenges? Like we need people who are mer- uh, not mercenaries. The mercenaries yeah. literally. They get in there and then they're like, oh, wow, I've increased my skill set. I'm really, really good with the sword. I wonder if somebody else would pay me more to cut off heads. And yeah. it's like, I really don't need that. Like, it's just, I mean, you, you do need a mercenary once in a while to go do something for you. But God, you got to be careful with them because they'll swing the sword at you next. Yeah. And this is, um, they'll go work for Monsanto. Yeah, try to kill this you. Is a culture. I, I, so we, we got to, how are we going to hire this many people who actually fit the profile? Boy, we got to rely on our existing employees to be good ambassadors for the business. Yep. And then we just got to uh, pay a disproportionate amount of uh, time, put a disproportionate amount of time into recruiting. And Listen, assessing people. if you're listening in my audience and you're a very gifted developer, engineer, scientist, yep. any of these things, um, I think this is the perfect place to work. Go check out farmersbusinessnetwork.com. I don't want to give out Amol's email, but I generally would say that if you are the CEO of the company, you're going to get first name at companyname.com. I'm just taking a guess here. It's, it's my uh, first initial and my last in, uh, oh, really? AD. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, email, so Amol email. doesn't forward? Yeah, email me. Okay. Email him and like literally do something with your life that's meaningful and that's also <laughs> challenging. Do not go work for Facebook or Google and work on the, you know, be the 700th and 18th person to try to make the ad network a little more deceptive and get people to click. It's meaningless. Go work at a startup with under a thousand people that wants to do something to help humanity. The big issues, energy, food, space, you know. <laughs> Communications. It's like, there's more important issues than these goddamn ad networks. Everybody's getting sucked into the, <laughs> the Huli vortex. Yeah. And working on the roof of Huli. You know the reference? Uh, you watch Silicon Valley? Silicon Valley, yeah. yeah. Oh, God. So many people on the Huli roof deck. Yeah, this is really important. I, I want to I wanna point out, you know, I think um, th- there are a lot of entrepreneurs now uh, in and around this region and other regions who are really are focused on impact investing. Sure. And I think that's, uh, that's so important. You know, I, I want to build a huge company and I want to make a a great return for all our shareholders, but I want to make a positive impact. And specifically in this case, I want to make a positive impact on our, our employees, on our farmers. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's a, 
you know, that's a culture that you embed in the business and then uh, you have to stick to it, yeah. especially when things are hard. You know what you should build into this? I was just thinking you have all these farmers. Do you do like a conference where they all come together? Yes. And you host them? It's called Farmer to Farmer. And oh. in fact, we got, it, it, was, it was- How a, many showed up? Last year we had 700, this year we'll have 1,500. That's genius. It's in Omaha, Nebraska. L Only farmers year. are allowed, right? You don't let anybody else in the room? Or? Other people can come, but the majority of them are our uh, member farmers, and it's free for them. If they signed up amazing. for the $500 service, uh, they can come for free. I had a couple of farmers who said, um, you know, I drank more beer at your conference than 500 bucks. Than nice. Spent. I and like it. Last year, we had a theme uh, was Moneyball, where we were showing how analytics was used in the nice. base world of baseball. Good. This year, we're talking about entrepreneurship, and we got Steve Case as one of our speakers. Oh, Steve's great. Gifts. I just had him on the program. He's a tremendous guy, very generous. You going to vote for him for president? I, I would if he was running. Yeah. I pushed him so hard on it. He is, uh, and I love the, the new book and the concept of the taking technology great. to new areas. He has to, has to, has to run for office. He's, he's he, just, I mean, um, we need people like him, and I know Sheryl Sandberg's going to run. She's totally going to run. So I think... Steve, Case, Shan Sandberg, either way, vice president, president, I don't care. You put those two in, since Bloomberg was, made a huge mistake, yeah. Mike, you should have run. I mean, he didn't think he could win, but yeah. you put Sheryl Sandberg, that's my dream ticket. Steve Case, Sheryl Sandberg, I, either I, way. I am, you know, to, for him to, to make the time to come and talk to farmers, like, like he's doing is just huge. And the opportunity then for our farmers to learn uh, and to understand the potential of technology, we're we're looking for a few others, and we try to pick people from outside the farming industry. Yeah. So that was a huge hit, and we're trying to turn it into the uh, the dream force of agriculture. This is what so they should speak. do. That. They should. All, I was thinking if you can get them all together. Yeah. Um, if they could start doing their own seed banking and seed trading, because yeah. they know that's a controversial issue. But if they could form a united front on the seed front. They could either drive down the prices or they could start producing their own seeds. Because yeah. like genetically modifying stuff is going to get easier and easier. This kits are, so imagine if you took 2,500 farmers and said, hey, if we each put $10,000 together, we could actually make our own open source seed. And if they could start open sourcing, uh, an open source seed movement together and each contribute to it, and if you contribute and you put your science into it, you could be on the verge of open source seeds. Is that a realistic goal, open source seating, and uh, that again, sort of... It probably on. depends on the market. I mean, yeah. uh, probably probably not, just because uh, of the amount of time, money, and effort that goes into seed breeding. I mean, it, it's just, it's really complicated science, and it uh -huh. takes a long time. But w what I think is is plausible is to get to a point where you know more conclusively as a farmer what, what genetics you're going to work on your farm. Uh, and then being able to purchase those and purchase them at the right cost. I mean, right. just that alone... Uh, I think as a huge efficiency gain for any individual farmer. Open source that seed stuff. It feels, and for some reason, I'm a, I'm a capitalist at heart, but it feels wrong that people can patent food. It feels wrong to me for some reason that they can patent the evolution of food. I know that there needs to be an, an economic incentive to do this work, yeah. but there's something that just feels wrong about these people discovering genes and then patenting them and, you know, it's almost like they've got the future of our food at risk. It's just, I don't know how you feel about that. Um, it's complex. It, that's a, it's a bigger, it's a bigger question. I mean, like, uh, for example, Pat, I, I think the question is how much of the value of those technologies get to the consumer and the farmer? Mm -hmm. That, that I think is a good analysis for somebody to really conclusively do is to say, okay, um, there are these enormous patent estates out there that exist in the world of agriculture. How much of the value that got created from those patents actually got to the farmer ah. or got to the consumer? In other words, do those evolved seeds that are patented do that much better than the regular seeds well, that are well, not? Well, we, we know they do better. The question is, d did they benefit the farmer though? Like right. for example, you can have a higher yield, but if, it, if the cost was equivalently high, then you didn't make any additional profit. So net, net. Net net, there was no, and then there's no. It might be better to use this. It might be better to sell seven million, not ten million, but net seven hundred thousand, not one hundred thousand. Yeah, and then there was no benefit passed along the chain all the way to the consumer, right? right? So, so that's that's a question that I think I haven't seen analysis on. That right. where they say, what is the ultimately? Did the farmer, did the consumer get benefit mm -hmm. out of the intellectual properties that exist in the market? Yeah. That's I'm going to go question. ahead and just make a wild guess that the value accrued to the people who patented the seeds. Just a wild guess <laughs> that they screwed over the farmers. Listen, this has been a fascinating hour and um, I'm really glad that smart people are working on food issues. Um, like I said, if you um, are smart, 
and you want to help humanity get to the next level and feed the 11 billion people that will be inhabiting our tiny startup known as planet earth that really needs some entrepreneurship i want you to go visit the farmers business network and apply but only apply if you're a missionary if you're a mercenary go work at google or huli or some other company that's <laughs> trying to trick people into clicking ads or some bullshit like that all right ad at farmersbusinessnetwork.com if you're brilliant if you're not brilliant you can email jobs at Google. Well, I'm sorry, jobs at Google.com. <laughs> I have to start giving dissing Google. But they're great. They've been great investors in our company. You shouldn't diss them. You know, it's like dissing Google is like you're dissing like a thousand different projects. So I can't really diss them. I just. Um, very mission very mission oriented, totally bought into our mission, been incredibly supportive of our good. company. Google Ventures? Google Ventures. Yeah, that's a good group. I, I, I think Google Ventures is pretty amazing. Yeah. I have to say, especially since. <laughs> They invested in Uber. <laughs> but be careful. Maybe they'll launch a competitor like they're doing with uh, Uber. They had, to kick, they had to kick them off the board. Did you read that? David Drummond had to come off the Uber board because now they're doing Waze car sharing. Well, I'll read the tabloids. I, gotta, I, I work with farmers. <laughs> tabloids. You know, it was I'm in the Wall Street about, Journal. <laughs> I'm, about, I'm, about, I'm in South Dakota working with farmers. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Stay focused. We'll see you all. Great guest, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie. Great job. I got a, I got a really good, uh, a good interview out of this. I think it's like I love getting smarter through people who are doing like important work. Thank you for uh, sharing so much information. Well, thanks, for, thanks for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. All right, we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Our iTunes review of the week is from Christian JD18. I literally earned a spot at a great firm using a lot of the knowledge I learned from Jason and his guests. Leave your review on iTunes and be featured on the show. 